You know, it's a, it's a misconception that they're either popular writers or artists. And that is well uh, illustrated by, by this panel. One thing that they have in common is they're all very serious writers, very serious craftsmen, but they also know how to tell a story and they have all achieved popular um, audiences. I'm speaking, of course, of uh, Peter Heller, Wally Cash, Ron Rash, and Garth Stein. We're going to start from uh, my right and go, go left. So um, I just got my first pair of uh, bifocals. On the, uh -huh. Peter Heller is the best-selling author of The Dog Stars. He holds an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop in both fiction and poetry. In addition, he's an award-winning adventure writer and a longtime contributor to NPR. Heller is a contributing editor at Outside Magazine, Men's Journal, and National Geographic Adventure, and a regular contributor to uh, Bloomberg Businessweek. He's also the author of several nonfiction books, including Kook, The Whale Warriors, and Hail or High Water, uh, Surviving Tibet's Songpo River. His most recent book, The Painter, is the story of a man who longs to transcend the shadows in his heart, a man intent on using the losses he has suffered to create a meaningful life. Please welcome Peter Heller. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, can you guys hear me? Is this, is this, oh, okay, there we go. Uh, this is a great book fair. Um, it's awesome. I love Miami. I've never been here until yesterday. Uh, so, um, I'm going to tell you what the book's about. Uh, the book's about a painter. He's an expressionist from Taos. He's pretty famous. Uh, his paintings sell for quite a lot of money. Uh, but he's got kind of a rough streak. Uh, he's actually part of a, a school of painters that actually exists in Taos. And it was especially um, in the 70s and 80s, there was this group of really sort of rough and tumble guys who were brawlers and drinkers and really good artists. And uh, Jim Stegner's one of those guys. He shot a guy in a bar for making a comment about his kid. Spent a year in Santa Fe State, and that's all part of the backstory. And then he suffers a tragedy, and I won't tell you what it is, but it's as bad as it gets. And then his marriage falls apart, which is not so good either. And uh, he moves up to a valley in western Colorado that exists. It's the North Fork of the Gunnison and tries to put his life back together. The place is gorgeous. Uh, it's a river wind run of cottonwoods and orchards and farms. It's all surrounded by mountains. It's a very peaceful place, a good place to sort of gather peace. Uh, that's not what happens, of course. Um, Jim loves to fly fish, and it's late August. It's just before archery season. And he found a creek that he loves to fish. Oh, he finds a model that uh, he can work with. She's really feisty. She understands art. She went to RISD for a year. And he's starting to paint again. And he's really uh, getting back into the groove, um, selling his work again, finding some peace. And one afternoon, he's driving up the dirt road of his favorite creek to go fishing. And he can't wait to fish. It's been a few days and there's a horse trailer blocking the road. And this outfitter, um, if you say that in Australia, they think it, it means a tailor. It's, it's not a tailor, it's a hunting guide. And he's trying to load a little strawberry roan, and the horse is balking, and this hunting guide gets frustrated, and he pulls a club out, and he starts to beat the horse to death. And Jim, um, he intervenes, and he, and he saves the horse. He kills the man, and he saves the horse. Um, he doesn't kill the guy right then, but right after. And the whole book is about what happens to his life and his work after this murder, and it's all organized around the painting. So every chapter is the catalog resume of a painting. It'll say like horse and crow, oil on linen, 20 by 30 inches, co private collection of the artist. And so you track the story through the work, through his painting, which is kind of neat. So uh, that's what the book is about. And I thought I would just read you one short scene. It's just about four minutes long. Uh, it's, um, Jim is uh, promoting his work and a new coffee table book about him. And he goes on a radio show. Uh, uh, you guys know the Embarcadero in San Francisco? You know, down on the wharf there, and there's the ferry building. 
Well, they have a radio show there that um, actually is real. It's called West Coast Live. And, it, and they, every Saturday, it's sort of a variety show with artists and musicians. And I went on there once, and I was promoting a book uh, about sur It was a surfing memoir called Kook. And I, was, I, I followed like four um, surf bands from California, Hawaii. If you ever want to like promote serious literature to an, you know, sort of a credulous public, don't follow for um, surf bands. It's not really fair <laughs> as a driving. Nobody wanted to listen to me. Uh, but uh, Jim goes on this show, and this is what happens to Jim. And it's from a chapter where the painting is called In Hostile Country, Oil on Canvas, 20 by 24 inches. Once an interviewer on a radio show right on the dock in San Francisco asked me why, coming from a family of Jippo loggers in Oregon, I had decided to paint. He was sitting on a stool beside me, and we were beneath a large window that looked from the Embarcadero out onto San Francisco Bay. I used to get drunk before interviews like this, but this was 8 a.m., a little too early even for me. The interviews tended to make me feel like a rabbit or a lamb caught above tree line at nightfall. Steve, who had just become my most important dealer and sort of my manager, swore he would cut me off and send my paintings back if I ever got drunk again on live radio or TV. So I was stone cold sober, except for a one hitter I did openly in the green room with a window looking out to Alcatraz, and I shivered and tried not to follow the progress of a small white sailboat and a big white ferry moving obliquely toward each other on the choppy blue water what a cool place to have a radio interview, right on the dock. And I tried to think seriously about the man's question. He was a good interviewer, warm and really interested, and he seemed to have actually read some of the coffee table book about me that I was now promoting. He must have looked carefully at the images of my work on the gallery's website. I could tell by his questions. But this question stopped my wildly beating heart for a moment and stiffened my bristles and raised hackles I suddenly discovered I had. Maybe I wasn't a rabbit after all. If I was a little stone before, I was not stone now. I blinked. I turned from the imminent and beautiful sea tragedy that was unfolding out the big window and stared at the man. What did you ask? Why does the son of a simple logger paint? Yes, he said, smiling. Why well, choose to be an outsider artist with all the vagaries of a fickle art market, the stormy uncertainties of creativity, I mean, it's practically asking to be poor, at least for a decade or two in the best case, isn't it? And your family can't have much money to help. I read that you grew up in a trailer in the woods. Why choose art when you might have a decent and rugged living as a logger like your father? I stared at him and thought about my father, who died on a 40-degree slope under five tons of dug fur when a choke cable snapped. For some reason then, I thought about his red Jean Sered chainsaw, which had a 36-inch bar, how he had set it down, still running on a big stump, and turned to lift a canteen filled with tap water when he died. What his buddy Egger told me as he handed me the saw, I sharpened it, he said. I thought about that. All Egger could say after sketching the scene was, I sharpened the chain. I think a lot of our listeners would like to know, the interviewer was saying, it seems terribly brave or reckless. I mean, where you came from, your father was practically illiterate. That, I could tell, was the question of the day. Was it reckless for the son of a Jippo logger to aspire to be an artist? It was the recklessness that informed this visceral, muscular, exuberant, outsider art. How he described it in the intro, I got it, how the art world worked. It was okay to be an outsider as long as you carried your spear and wore your loincloth, stay primitive. Don't get any uppity ideas. He widened his smile until it was pressing against his cheeks. I looked at him. I knew he would never ask the same question of a RISD grad. I had spent nights in jail because of men like this, men who condescended, who impugned, getting in fights. I had paid fines, been on probation. I said, is this show live? It is, right? Now it was his turn to blink. He didn't understand. I could see it, but he held his smile. Yes, of course. That's why we call it West Coast Live. Ha! A flash of fear appeared in his eyes, there and gone like the flank of a trout catching sunlight. 
Okay, I nodded in some kind of complicit agreement. I stuck out my hand like for a handshake. He hesitated. He seemed relieved. Okay, a handshake, he said. Let's shake on it to the recklessness of the artist who is truly down out of the hills and to the recklessness of live radio. He held out his long, slender hand, and I took it warmly like the fish that it was and gripped it the way you grip a big brown to get the hook out, and then I squeezed. He chirped like a chipmunk, then groaned. I squeezed. He pulled away, then tugged, and he was half laughing, half crying. Ow! Okay, okay, uncle. And then he was kind of rearing back out of his stool, and then he was howling, and then I felt a bone snap one of the knuckles in the first joint, and he screamed an unbridled, uncensored live radio shriek. And in his panic, he had knocked over the stool, and two sound men or whatever they were, stout guys in baggy jeans, shot across the floor and smothered me. They pulled me off and just half ushered, half shoved me out the double doors that led onto the bright atrium gallery and the wide steps. Nobody followed. No cops, nothing. I stood at the top of the steps with the blood pounding in my temples and looked down at the bustling crowd milling through the indoor market, the coffee shops, bookstores, and restaurants and felt the sun through the skylight warm on my shoulders and let the anger wash through me like warmed oil, a fine skim of anger on every working part until I didn't feel it at all, except that I moved smoother, cleaner than I had in weeks. I felt as if the ghost of my father were standing next to me, and he was laughing. Pop, I said out loud, fuck the fuckers. Let's go get drunk. And I bounded down the steps. Um, so I just, just want to add really quickly that um, I read that in, the, um, in New York. I, I did my first reading at the Strand on the, on the tour, and my four little nieces were in the front row. And eight to like, 14, and my editor emailed me the next day. She said, my favorite part of the whole thing was watching little Cammie's face when you said, fuck the fuckers. She like, she went, like, it was full of glee and like disbelief and like, Uncle Ting said, fuck it, or fuckers. And then she looked at her, her cousins and her sister and they, the whole, it was like a church pew moment. They all looked at each other and it was, they were about to erupt in laughter in this like venerable room at the Strand. <laughs> and then the oldest one kind of went like that shut him down. So uh, anyway, I'm glad you guys didn't seem to be too ruffled. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Ron Rash is the author of the 2009 Penn Faulkner finalist and New York Times bestselling novel, Serena, in addition to four other prize-winning novels, The Cove, One Foot in Eden, Saints at the River and The World Made Straight. Also four collections of poems and five collections of short stories. His most recent book is Something Rich and Strain, Strange, Selected Stories. Um, it says here, no one captures the complexities of Appalachia, a rugged, brutal landscape of exquisite beauty as evocatively and indelibly as, as Ron Rash does, and I believe that to be true. Um, let's welcome Ron Rash. Good to be here. Uh, I left. It was under 10 degrees in Western North Carolina, so uh, you know it's uh, quite a different feel. I, this book, uh, my, my book, uh, something old, something new in a way. It's uh, rich, something rich and strange. It's 34 short stories. It's I, I started writing short stories in my early to mid 20s, and some of the stories are from that period. When from that time, I was I think the first one I was 24 when I wrote it. So I've got three very early ones in there, and, and a few new ones, uh, much more recent. But uh, it's 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 probably of all the books I've written, the one I'm most proud of. Uh, I love the short story form. I think having written novels and poems, it is the most difficult. But it's also, in many ways, the most wondrous when it's done well. You know, you read an Alice Monroe story or a William Trevor story or go back to Chekhov and O'Connor, Welty. Uh, just this amazing thing where you bring the intensity of language, uh, the, the, the spilling of every sentence counting of a poem, every word, and yet the reader leaves a short story, the really good short story, not wishing for anything more. Uh, and, and very often it's almost as if you've given the reader this one moment where 
everything this person will, has been and will be is crystallized. And that's, to me, the magic of the form. And I called the, the collection Something Rich and Strange. Uh, that's a line from The Tempest by Shakespeare. And if you know that, that play, and I love that play, in a sense that was uh, Shakespeare's farewell to the theater. Uh, there's a scene very early on when you have this mystical creature, Ariel, um, speaking uh, full fi fathom five by father lies. And she's telling this young man his father has disappeared into the ocean and drowned, but in a sense not died, but uh, undergone a sea change into something rich and strange. And uh, it just struck me that uh, over the years reading that, that that in a sense is what uh, literature does at its best. It, it can very often take really sad, tragic events and somehow through the art uh, present them in a way into the sublime to where uh, something, even something very dark, becomes rich and strange. And so that's um, you know, what I've attempted to do in this book. And I thought I would read just uh, a brief part of the, the story, the title story, rich, Something Rich and Strange, which is a, a rather mystical story. Uh, I will not be, have the time to read all of it, but uh, I did want to at least read the opening. She follows the river's edge downstream, leaving behind her parents and younger brother who still eat their picnic lunch. It is Easter break and her father has taken time off from his job. They have followed the Appalachian Mountains south, stopping first in Gatlinburg, then the Smokies, and finally this river. She finds a place above a falls where the water looks shallow and slow. The river is a boundary between Georgia and South Carolina, and she wants to wade into the middle and place one foot in Georgia and one in South Carolina so she can tell her friends back in Nebraska she has been in two states at the same time. She kicks off her sandals and enters. The water so much colder than she imagined, quickly deeper, up to her kneecaps, the current surging under the smooth surface. She shivers. On the far shore, a granite cliff casts this section of river into shadow. She glances back to where her parents and brother sit on the blanket. It is warmer there, the sun full upon them. She thinks about going back, but is almost halfway now. She takes a step, and the water rises higher on her knees. Four more steps, she tells herself. Just four more, and I'll turn back. She takes another step and the bottom is no longer there and she's being shoved downstream and she does not panic because she has passed all her Red Cross courses. The water shallows and her face breaks the surface and she breathes deep. She tries to turn her body so she won't hit her head on a rock and for the first time she's afraid and she's suddenly back underwater and hears the rush of water against her ears. She tries to hold her breath, but her knee smashes against a boulder and she gasps in pain and water pours into her mouth. Then for a few moments, the water pools and slows. She rises, coughing up water, gasping air, her feet dragging the bottom like an anchor trying to snag waterlogged wood or rock jut. And as the current quickens again, she sees her family running along the shore and she knows they're shouting her name though she cannot hear them. And as the current turns her, she hears the falls and knows there's nothing that will keep her from it. As the current quickens and quickens and another rock smashes against her knee, but she hardly feels it as she snatches another breath. And she feels the river fall and she falls with it as water whitens around her. And she falls deep into the whiteness and as she rises, her head scrapes against a rock ceiling. And the water holds her there and she tells herself, don't breathe but the need rises inside her, beginning in the upper stomach, then up through her chest and throat. And as that need reaches her mouth, her mouth and nose open and the lungs explode in pain. And then the pain is gone as bright colors shatter around her like glass shards. And she remembers her sixth grade science class, the gurgle of the aquarium at the back of the room the smell of chalk dust that morning, the teacher held a prism out the window so it might fill with color. And she has a final 
beautiful thought that she is now inside that prism and knows something even the teacher does not know, that the prism's colors are voices, voices that swirl around her head like a crown. And at that moment, her arms and legs, she did not even know were flailing, cease, and she becomes part of the river. Thank you. Garth Stein is the author of the New York Times bestselling novel, The Art of Racing in the Rain. Now, I do appreciate uh, an author with a, with a knack for titles. Published in 35 languages, he is also the author of two previous novels, How Evan Broke His Head and Other Secrets and Raven Stole the Moon. Stein's last novel is A Sudden Light, which is the story of, well, I'll let Garth tell you. Garth? Before we get... Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before we get started, I have one thing I have to do. Hold on. Y'all are going to be on Facebook later on tonight. Um, uh, thanks so much for having me out. Uh, this is very exciting um, uh, for a lot of reasons, but mostly because I'm already seeing all these similarities. My, my book has to do with the uh, timber family, but not the logger side, the timber baron side. So. Uh, in the Northwest, so we've got some of that in there. And of course, one of my uh, main characters is named Serena, uh, so I have that in common with you, and I have to find out what I have in, in common with you. Um, let me just, uh, I, I'm not gonna read a whole lot, I just wanna give you kind of a background on the story, and uh, I, the best way to start, I think, is to read the first paragraph from the, the prologue, uh, The Curse. Growing up in rural Connecticut, I had been told the name Riddell meant something to people in the Northwest. My paternal great-great-grandfather was someone of significance, my mother explained to me. Elijah Riddell had accumulated a tremendous fortune in the timber industry, a fortune that was later lost by those who succeeded him. My forefathers had literally changed the face of America with axes and two-man saws and diesel donkeys to buck the fallen with mills to pulp, pulp the corpses and scatter the ashes, they carved out a place in history for us all. And that place, I was told, was cursed. So the protagonist of our story is uh, Trevor Riddell. He's the youngest in the long line of the Riddell family. Uh, the way the book sets up is through a lens. So it's being told by a, an adult, Trevor, telling a story to his, his children um, on the location of the North Estate, which was this great uh, uh, estate owned by Elijah, started by Elijah Riddell. And he's, uh, he's telling the story of what happened to him when he was 14 years old, and he first was brought um, to the North Estate by his father, Jones Riddell. And so to really put you in mind of this, I need to ask you, we have to do like a visualization sort of thing. So I'm gonna try and, everybody kind of close your eyes or, and meditate here, and I'm gonna try and put you into the mood of, of, uh, of Trevor Riddell, keeping in mind that it's in 1990 is when the bulk of the story takes place. So it's pre-digital age. So you're a 14-year-old boy, you're actually a really bright only child, and you live on this wonderful little farmland in Connecticut. It's got a little field out in front of it, it's got a little creek on the far side, and it's a nice life, you like it. Um, your father is a very strange and remote man. He, he doesn't talk about his past at all. Uh, he, he builds wooden boats for a living in the old traditional wooden boat building fashion, and so it's very painstaking and not highly lucrative. Uh, he's never told you anything about his family history. Your mother, you love your mother very much. She's very bright. She has a PhD in comparative literature from Harvard University, originally from England. And she reads constantly. All she does is read. She doesn't teach. She doesn't do anything with her brilliance except read and read and read. And books are everywhere in your farmhouse. She makes you read, too. At 14 years old, you're incredibly well read. And then the bottom falls out of your idyllic life. Your father's business goes bankrupt. They have to declare, uh, they have to declare bankruptcy personal bankruptcy, and, and then the strain of this financial issue uh, drives your parents apart. They separate. Your mother goes back to England to be with her family for the summer, and your father takes you to his, where he's from, in Seattle, just north of Seattle, uh, at, for the summer, to meet your aunt, Serena, and your grandfather, who you've never met before. So you fly there, you get to Seattle, you drive through the city, you get to the north end, and then you go down some narrow roads, and then there's a, a guard shack with a gate. Imagine that, your father grew up in a gated community you never knew. You go down these long, winding paths, and it's very lush and green, trees everywhere. You can't even see the houses, there, but the glimpses you catch, they're major, they're big houses. And you get to the end of the road, and there's, in front of you is a gigantic meadow. 
And to the right is uh, Puget Sound, sparkling in the sunlight in July, and then Kitsap Peninsula, and beyond that, the Olympic Mountains. If you know Seattle, you know the Olympic Mountains are all there to the west. And then you look to the left, and on the other side of that meadow is a gigantic house, a mansion of huge proportions. It uh, must have 50 bedrooms. It's, it's, what's amazing about it is it's three stories high, but it's built entirely out of in whole trees uh, as pillars holding up the roof of this, and with bark still on them, these gigantic trees. It's, a temple, it's truly a temple to timber. So you go down all the way to the house, and you get to the house, and you go inside, and it's like going into a museum. It's a, it's a time capsule. It smells of must, and there's uh, faded uh, oriental rugs all over the floors, and there's grandfather clock that isn't tick-tocking. And in the parlor to your right, there's an eight-foot-tall painting of this, this guy, he's an old man with long white hair, and he's holding a cane, and he's reaching out of the painting as if he's going to pull you into the painting with him. Your father comes up behind you and says, that's your great-great-grandfather, Elijah Riddell. He built this house. So you go back into the kitchen, this massive kitchen that's in this old crumbling house. You go back there and you meet your Aunt Serena for the first time. And when you, you, you learned you were going to meet your aunt, you thought, oh, I'm going to meet Mrs. Doubtfire. You know, oh, oh, I'll take care of you now, kind of dowdy old lady. In fact, she's 35 years old and she's smoking hot. And she's wearing this very seductive sort of dress. And she speaks with a weird affectation, like she's out of a Tennessee Williams play. And she never really gives you an answer to any questions that you have. And she, has, she walks around barefoot constantly. And her toenails are painted this mesmerizing color of blue that you just can't seem to take your eyes off of. You can imagine how you, this can mess with your 14-year-old mind. And then you meet your grandpa, Grandpa Samuel. Looks remarkably like the guy in the painting. He's an old guy. He's wearing all black clothes, and he's sitting out on the front porch being baked by the sun and drinking rosemary lemonade. And he's on his shirt. There are some words on his shirt. So you read the words. You look closely. It's, they're kind of small, and they say, his shirt says, God was my co-pilot, but then we crashed in the mountains, and I had to eat him. Oh, what on earth? This is, you're so baffled by all of this. And so you say to him, that's very funny. That's, and he says, what's funny? And you say, your shirt, that's, that's kind of funny. And he looks at it, and he says, Serena dresses me. He doesn't know what's on his own shirt. And so, so Serena, it's just his whole weird world. And, and, and as you start to live in this house, now remember, it's 1990. You don't have an Xbox. You don't have satellite. TV, you don't have the internet, none of that stuff. And you're in this house, and it's just the four of you. And it's very far away from the rest of the world, it seems like. You're very isolated. Your father is reticent at best. He's got some baggage that you don't know about, and he won't tell you anything about it. Your, your grandfather may or may not have dementia. Serena keeps saying he has Alzheimer's, but it's not quite clear. Does he or not? And your father, uh, uh, and then Serena herself, dealing with her, is uh, she's an enigma. Everything's a match. Everything's a battle. She, she goes nine different directions at the same time, so you can't get the truth out of her. But the more you start to explore the house, the more you realize that maybe there is someone else there. You know, these houses in the old days, they were built with uh, servant stairways. They were built with secret doors so the servants could deliver the tea at the proper time and not be seen. Servants weren't supposed to be seen in those days when it was built around the turn of the 20th century. And so there are all sorts of crazy things that you can find. And maybe you find... Uh, some letters from one relative to another, or maybe you find a diary, and maybe you find some other secret things in this, and you start to put a story together. And then you start listening to the whisperings in the house, and you realize there may be somebody else there, but not maybe, maybe not a person. Maybe there is actually a spirit of the house, as your father and Aunt Serena have suggested. I want to read this one little passage here that gives you an idea, introduces you to the spirit. As you learn more, as you believe more, you start to realize that there really is this person there, and you suspect that he is your great-granduncle, Benjamin Riddell. We were more than a week into our stay, ten years by the calendar, and I had taught myself how to walk down the long, dark hallways without making a sound. I had familiarized myself with all the stairways that were obvious and some that were not, back stairs and front, servant stairs and front of house. I had found linen closets with hidden panels to store things. What was stored in these places over the decades, I didn't know. I understood Riddell House in a place I could only describe as fundamental. Sometimes, when I walked down the long corridor at night and ventured into the south wing, I felt as if I had become the house. The house told me where to turn, where to go next, what to discover. And when I stopped in a room during my nightly explorations, I always knew Ben was there with me, because I breathed with measured breaths, and I didn't move a gram of body weight. I made no sound. I waited until Ben's shallow breath fell out of sync with mine, and I could hear us both breathing. 
I didn't want anything but ben, from Ben but the truth. He was there when my grandmother died. He knew what happened between my father and his mother and father, and he seemed to be the only one who was willing to tell me anything. I stood in a room that was entirely empty except for a bare mattress on a metal frame. The moon shone across the water and tickled the ceiling with, and walls with flecks of light. I heard Ben breath, independent of my own, so I knew he was with me. He placed his hand on my shoulder and leaned toward me so I could feel his phantom weight, and he whispered my name. Tell me, I said, but he said nothing. That night, I had another dream. So as Trevor begins to believe more in Ben, Ben starts giving him things, and he starts giving them things in the form of dreams um, and important information about things that happened around the turn of the 20th century and why the family fell out of grace and why they lost their entire fortune and why they're in the position they're in now. So uh, he starts to learn these things. This is an idea that I got, uh, interestingly enough, uh, by, by my father dying. Um, the book is dedicated to my dead father. Um, and uh, immediately the, uh, my publisher called me up and said, that sounds a little angry. And I said, well, it is a little. Uh, but it, when I was in the early stages of this book, uh, my father got a lung ailment and he died. And um, several months after that, he, he came to me in a series of dreams that I remember very clearly. They weren't really dreams, they were visions. They were not repetitive in any way. They, I remember them, uh, like words that were being said. And he had these things to say five nights in a row and they didn't repeat at all. And he, uh, they were just talking, we were having a conversation. And then he went away. Now we can ascribe that to science and say, uh, okay, uh, I had a pepperoni pizza and I was traumatized by my father's death and, uh, and my synapses randomly fired and I had these dreams. Or we can look beyond that and we can say, no, maybe my father really did have something unresolved, and what better way for a spirit to reach out to us but through our dreams? So I choose to prefer the latter. I, that's what I write. I write fiction. I write with, with a magical, realistic uh, element to it. And so uh, A Sudden Light is a, is a ghost story, but it's my interpretation of a ghost story. It's about, um, it's about fathers and sons and how that relationship ripples through generations of a family. It's about our connection with nature. There's some historical fiction in there, Teddy Roosevelt, these sorts of things, the, the timber industry around the turn of the 20th century. But mostly it's about um, our being open to seeing the unseen, to seeing the connections that maybe aren't so obvious but must be there. We use words like luck and coincidence a lot. Why? Maybe, there, maybe it isn't just lucky, maybe it isn't just coincidence, maybe there are reasons for things that we just don't understand. And so if you take that line, and you, you go with it, I think you will enjoy a sudden light. Thanks. When Wiley Cash's first novel came out, a reviewer wrote, a land more kind than home reads as if Cormac McCarthy decided to rewrite To Kill a Mockingbird. Now after getting a review like that, many writers would have Quit and going home, but uh, but not Wiley. His I would have, but I was in a contract for a second book, <laughs> so I couldn't actually quit. His new novel, uh, The Stark Road to Mercy, is a tale of love and atonement, blood and vengeance. When an errant father suddenly reappears and steals away his children, the girl's court-appointed guardian learns the father is linked to a multi-million dollar robbery. Uh, no less than uh, Jess Walter, the author of the much uh, of the very of the well-regarded *Beautiful Ruins*, has called um, this *Dark Road to Mercy* a terrific, moving, and propulsive novel. Wally Cash. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here, and uh, it's a real pleasure. I've never been to Miami before, and I can't think of a better reason to come. And it's a treat to be on a panel with these guys, whose work I admire so much, and whose careers I've, I've watched and, and admired um, for so long. Um, I wrote This Dark Road to Mercy primarily because my first novel uh, was apparently terrible because I could find no one to represent it. And then when I found someone to represent it, that person could find no one to purchase it. And so I thought, well, I've written a failed book, and that's okay. You know, it's the first time I tried to write a book, and that's what happens. And so I thought, if I'm ever going to be stupid enough to try to write a second novel and develop, you know, devote that much time to this you know, very lonely venture, what would, I, what would I write about? And I remembered a story my wife told me uh, about growing up in Wilmington, North Carolina, where we live now, down on the coast. And according to her, she was, uh, when she was a little girl, 
an incredible softball player. I've seen no video evidence or uh, stat sheets or even family anecdotes to back up that claim. But according to her, her only weakness was that she didn't know how to slide into base. And so in the summertime, when her dad would get off work, they would go out to the ball field in her neighborhood and they would practice sliding into base. And I thought that was such a beautiful image. If you happen to be driving by that ball field on a summer night in the south and the windows are down and the crickets are chirping and the magnolias are blue, I don't know. And you see a father and a daughter out there on a baseball field and you think, that's such a beautiful image. Nicholas Sparks should write a novel about those two people and then make you love one or both of them and then kill them in a completely implausible set of circumstances <laughs> that you would never see coming. Unless you read anything else that he wrote, and then you'd be like, fooled again. Um, but I, I looked at that image of that father and daughter, and I thought, as sweet as that is, those kinds of stories don't interest me so much as stories where an individual has made a terrible decision. I'm interested in stories where somebody makes a bad decision and has to pay for that decision, either in the ways that it affects their lives or, or in the way it affects the life of someone they love, perhaps a child. And so I thought, well, how can I complicate this image of this little, this little girl and her father? And I thought, well, maybe the dad's abandoned her, maybe her mother's dead, maybe she's in foster care, maybe she has a younger sister. And I kicked around this idea, and I thought, well, maybe since they're at a ball field, he played baseball, maybe he played minor league ball, maybe he played ball for the Gastonia Rangers where I grew up. Oh, Sammy Sosa played for the Gastonia Rangers. And maybe this novel set in the summer of 1998 when Sammy Sosa was battling Mark McGuire for the home run race. Maybe this dad played with Sammy Sosa and he kidnaps these girls to try to prove he wasn't always this loser by taking him to go see Sammy Sosa play baseball. Um, but that was all too sweet, so I had to find some way to make it, you know, at least a little bit threatening. So hopefully I did that. But I thought I would read uh, just the opening uh, paragraph or so uh, of this novel, The Stark Road to Mercy. This novel has three narrators. The first is that 12-year-old girl who's on third base. She knows her dad is a total loser, but she really wishes he wasn't. Uh, the second is their court-appointed guardian ad litem. He's an ex-police officer with tragedy in his own past. So when these two girls go missing, he thinks that if he can rescue them, he can rescue something about his own life and his own history and something about his relationship with his high school-aged daughter. And the third narrator is a bounty hunter who was once a promising slugger in the minor leagues whose career was cut short by a pitch the girl's father threw back in the 80s. And this is how the novel opens, and it is narrated by Easter. Wade disappeared on us when I was nine years old, and then he showed up out of nowhere the year I turned 12. By then, I'd spent nearly three years listening to Mom blame him for everything from the lights getting turned off to me and Ruby not having new shoes to wear to school. And by the time he came back, I'd already decided that he was the loser she'd always said he was. But it turns out he was much more than that. He was also a thief. And if I'd known what kind of people were looking for him, I never would have let him take me and my little sister out of Gastonia, North Carolina in the first place. My earliest memories of Wade are from my mom taking me to the baseball stadium at Sims Field back before she died. She'd point to the field and say, there's your daddy right there. I wasn't any older than three or four, but I can still remember staring out at the infield where all the men looked the exact same in their uniforms, wondering how I would ever spot my daddy at a baseball game if he looked just like everybody else. It's funny to think about that now, because on the day he decided to come back for us, I knew Wade as soon as I saw him sitting up in the bleachers down the first baseline. I'd always called him Wade because it never felt right to think of him as dad or daddy or anything else kids are supposed to call their parents. Parents who got called things like that did stuff for their kids that I couldn't ever imagine Wade doing for us. All he'd ever done for me was give me a baby sister named Ruby and enough stories for my mom to spend the rest of her life telling. But she ended up dying just before I turned 12, which was the only reason Wade came looking for me and Ruby in the first place. Thank you. Okay, we have time for some questions. We have a microphone here, and I'm going to take the prerogative of asking the first question. Um, Ron Rash, uh, your new book is subtitled Selected Stories, so I'm wondering who did the selecting? If it was you, what, were you, what was your criteria, and how many stories were left out? Okay. I've probably written about 100 short stories, and uh, a 
lot of those, you know, I never even attempted to publish, but I, I, I made the selections all, uh, just by myself, and also I uh, put them in a particular order, uh, and I wanted it to, in a sense, certain themes and certain time periods to resonate, so... Uh, yeah, you know, I did it all myself, and you know, kind of, it was kind of interesting looking back over about 35 years of writing uh, mm -hmm. to see what what held up and what didn't. And there were some that uh, didn't hold up that were cringeworthy, but uh, I found some <laughs> that did. Okay, please. I'm sure that there are some questions for our four distinguished uh, novelists. Yes, can you come to the microphone? <laughs> you got angry artists, you've got a girl dying right away, and, and <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's <very good>. okay. <laughs> Mine implies an afterlife. That's happy, right? <laughs> well, I mean, I get that question sometimes. Why are your books... Well, I get that question a lot. People will say, why are your books so dark? And I'll say, well, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily see them that way. And I think without darkness, you don't really know what light is. And so we have, you know, someone like in Peter's novel who's gone through so much tragedy. And the novel was about him trying to work through that and deal with that. And that's not dark, that's real. And there's a huge difference between dark and real. Dark is like, you know horror movies and Night of the Living Dead and Walking Dead and things like that and, and even something like that still has these moments of beauty where people make incredible sacrifices or have these lovely sentiments. I, I think we're all kind of working on the same level of the idea of redemption, right? Sure, absolutely. I mean, so, I mean, and redemption though, how you have to be, you have to, again, you have to show the highs and the lows. I mean, if we lived in a flat world, it'd be really, really boring. We need peaks and valleys and so we need to make the journey over the mountains and down into the darkness of the valleys in order to to reach our, our, our redemption, our salvation. So I, I think that you can view them through any number of lights, right? I had a lot of fun writing this book. Um, I laughed a lot, and, and I think the ending is, is redemptive. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. I start with the first line I started writing, and, um, and, it, and the voice sounded a lot like a friend of mine named Jim Wagner, who's a painter in Taos. And, uh, and I decided after three days that um, it wasn't him because he was still alive and the liability issues would be too dicey. <laughs> but after like three weeks, I was like, oh God, it really sounds like Jim, I gotta call him. So I called him up and I said, hey Jim, um, this character, you know, uh, I'm writing about an expressionist artist from Taos. He's like, oh great. And I was like, yeah, and he shot a guy in a bar who made a comment about his kid just like you. Silence, yeah. And uh, he spent a year in Santa Fe State just like you, silence kind of looks like you, you know, and he talks like you, and his paintings are, you know, and they call him Hemingway down at the river, he loves to fish, <laughs> it's like I went on and on. <laughs> at the end he goes, oh, actually that sounds really great, you know, let me know um, how it goes. And at the end, I sent him, when I finished it, um, I sent him the first copy, and uh, he doesn't read much, he's like dyslexic, but his wife said he just flipped the pages for like four days, it was like, oh, Mary, you gotta hear this, this is incredible. And at the end, he called me up and he said, I love this. I'm walking around my house wondering if I killed a guy. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it was it was it was it was funny. I'm... Okay. Well, as as a reader, let me say that there's also the aesthetic pleasure. You know, some books are so beautifully written that just reading them, no matter what they're about, uh, gives the brightness and the joy. Okay. More questions? Yes, ma'am. That's how good we were, guys. A hand to us. <laughs> we broke your 30-year silence, unless it's a complaint. You're like, I'm never step, coming step, back. Step, step closer to the microphone. We want to get this recorded for posterity. Uh, okay, is this? Yes, very good. Okay, just a minute. Okay. I, do, I read a lot, and I can't stand saccharine books, and I'm a librarian, and I 
kind of handle books real funny. Uh, and I, I read a lot and a lot and a lot, and I very often cannot tell you what a book was about. I can say, oh my God, you've got to read this book. Why do I have to read this book? Because I can tell you how the book made me feel. And young man, um, <coughs> you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When I read <laughs> The Art of Racing in the Rain, my friends got so sick. You can tell I'm a little prone to hyperbole. And I just love the dog. Can't remember his name. Did remember he was a dog. And I can remember, and I said, and there's a little bit of philosophy there, too, because when he explains how you hold the wheel of the car going around the... I knew exactly what he was, uh, and I drive fast, but that's all. But anyway, I, so <laughs> I, I, just, I came to see what you looked like, and now <laughs> I have three more books that I can read, and if I don't remember your story, I will remember how I felt. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank, that's very kind of you. You're going to love these guys' book uh, just as much. <laughs> Uh, the funny thing about the art of racing in the rain, though, is you know when I wrote that book, no one wa no one wanted it at all, and I gave it. I sent it to my agent. He said, "No publisher was going to publish this book." He said, "Do me a favor, throw this thing in the garbage, and go write me something I can sell." So I was. It was like in November, just before Thanksgiving. I was going into the grocery store literally to get my Thanksgiving turkey, and I was had him on the cell phone, and he said this, and these two words popped into my mind. Not those words two other words, and I said, you're fired. And so I had to go in search of an agent. It took me almost a year to find another agent who would take it. Um, but Enzo almost never came to you, I so. Actually, I actually bought copies of it to give to my brother, because I don't often read books that he and I would buy. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the greatest recommendations I've ever heard. <laughs> Would anybody care to follow that comment? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, lots of, lots of great, yes ma'am. Hi, um, forgive me for the categorizations, but I'm, I'm, I don't know how else to phrase this. But talk to us a little bit about um, commercialization versus kind of literary and what goes on in your head when you're thinking about plot and how the New York Times is going to review this book when you're finished. And you know what I'm saying. You know that, that sense that maybe just, just, it's just taking it just a little too far and they gotta pull it back and dig a little deeper for character when you really want it to go someplace else. I'd just like to know whether or not you tug with that. Uh, could we first call for hands on how, how, how many of you guys have been reviewed by the New York Times? <laughs> Good, I haven't. <laughs> maybe I have too much plot. <laughs> I don't think about that at all. Uh, I've never thought about, you know, commercial or, you know, uh, I have to satisfy myself. And if I can satisfy myself, uh, uh, and I, I don't mean that, in, I mean that in a way that I've told the story as honestly and as uh, beautifully as far as the language that I can, that I, the rest of it's out of my hands. I try not to write commercially because I don't like money. Um, I have a real aversion to wealth. Um, no, I just try to create characters that I believe in, that I want to spend time with. And I think that if you create interesting enough characters that you want to spend time with and pay attention to, then something interesting will happen to them. And that's where plot comes from. And, and plot, pared down as simply as possible, is a character's desire thwarted, right? So what does your character want? What's in the way of that? That's what your plot is. And I think you can have as much plot as you want. I mean, a novel like Lonesome Dove is all plot. There's an end point. That's, that's the ultimate plot. But that's a literary novel because those characters are so rich and so vibrant and so beautiful. And they all want something. I could just add, too, that I don't know how um, these guys work, but probably in a similar way. Um, when I wrote The Dog Stars, I didn't want to know what was going to happen because I wrote a bunch of nonfiction books. And so um, 
I started with a first line and had no idea. And that was, I called, I didn't know if that was allowed. Like, mm -hmm. are you allowed to do that? And I called my buddy, my best friend in high school is Carlton Cuse, and he's the showrunner for the, and the producer for Lost, the TV show. That really popular, and it's got like eight subplots going all the time. I knew he'd know about structure. He didn't seem that smart in high school, but he, he, he I guess he was. <laughs> Uh, he's really smart. Um, and I called and said, hey, you know, do you know any novels that just start with the first line and just let it rip and have no clue? And he said, um, um, yes, I've worked with Stephen King. Oftentimes he starts with a first line. It's a voice. He doesn't know who's talking. That's a character. It's in a place. And there's a situation because there's always a situation. And he would write into the plot. And he said something really surprised me. He said, Elmore Leonard, too. He, wrote, he worked with him. South Florida, you know, tightly plotted crime novels start often started with the first line and just let it go. And um, I, I like to do that too. So you're you're not thinking about, you know, I'm with Ron. I mean, you're just thinking about um, being true to your character and the story and the language, the music of the language. Uh, yeah, I think there are two different discussions here. There's the one of the writer's process, which is often very different. I do do a lot of. I grew up in a world of theater and I made documentary films for ten years. So I do do a lot of dramatic structure, it's just the world I grew up in. But um, how we arrive at what we arrive at is separate from how, you know, the, the, the world, the, the reviewers of the world, the, the critics of the world categorize things. And so uh, I think that's a kind of a different, that's more for like sociologists than, because everybody has a different method of getting to where they get to, but, uh, you know, Joseph Heller was famous for that. First sentence would come to him and then he would just type the book. You know, the thing is people who do that are, you know, they're really doing secret things that they don't even know they're doing. Maybe they don't know they're doing it. Maybe they're so, such a genius, they don't, they're not conscious of the way things, the tumblers are falling in their head. Uh, you know, and some people just have to work a little bit harder or differently at the same problem. Uh, yeah, we're all trying to get somebody to turn the page. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key. And you can do that in about a hundred ways. You can do it with language, you can do it with voice, you can do it with character, uh, and uh, but that's the key, you know, that the make the reader want to turn the page, or have to turn the page, even better, have to turn it. But it, and it, like as Ron said earlier, as writers, we also want to turn the, turn the page too. Like we want to yeah. mm -hmm. believe in it and live in it and want to be in it, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, in a similar vein, uh, for manly writers, it's unusual uh, in this, to have a panel like this, um, you know, it's well known that most readers are women. Do you think about that while you're writing? Is that uh, uh, most readers of fiction are women. Men do read, uh, but they read predominantly nonfiction. That's true. Right, but you're all novelists, and that's uh, we're all talking about novels. So, God darn it! <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I suspect all of us have embraced beautiful things up here. You, I mean, if, you, I'm actually. <laughs> I got to. I got to baby to prove it. I, uh, um, I I'm in a, a book, book group um, back. I'm from Seattle. Uh, I'm in a book group of men, and we drink scotch and read books, and um, and we read 80 percent fiction. But we're like really sensitive in Seattle. I mean, we're like so. We're so tired of like smoking weed at gay marriages. It's like insane. It's just that's all we do. So I guess we read a lot of fiction. I don't know. It's smoking weed. I'm I'm from Denver, and um, in Denver, it's really good to have a wife. If you're a fiction writer, to be your first reader. I second so, that. 
I, I read real. everything to my wife as it's in progress, and it's she's the perfect, perfect reader because I'll be reading along, and then she'll she'll get this expression that sort of looks like sleep, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, "What do you think, Ting?" And she's like, "There's too much frigging fishing." And then I read her in the Dog Stars, I read her this sex scene. I'd never written a sex scene. I was like really shy about it. Like, you know, you really shouldn't have to write a sex scene, but you sort of do sometimes. And I wrote this sex scene and she said, it's all right, but you have to make the readers know that she has an orgasm or he's gonna look really selfish. <laughs> so you can read it in the Dog Stars, you know. I mean, I I made sure you know, <laughs> but that was that was Kim. <laughs> and I don't really think about gender until, or the reader necessarily, until it comes time to talk about the cover, and that's kind of not my specialty. So I kind of let go of that, to be honest. Yeah, the story is the story, right? Yeah, the story is the story. You can't really think about. You it. You can't worry about who's reading it, unless you're writing genre fiction, in which case you do. But that's that's not this panel. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Serena is a novel that's set in the 1920s in Western North Carolina. It's about the logging industry there. Uh, that novel, and, and this is the way it works for me, maybe because of uh, the fact that I'm a poet as well as a, a novelist, but uh, that novel came to me. I was uh, actually driving on a two-lane mountain road, and a lot of times I kind of like to be in that kind of state where I don't have the radio on. I'm just daydreaming a little bit. And an image came to me of a woman on horseback. And uh, I could see her in silhouette. Uh, it was dawn. It was early, early morning. The sun was coming behind her. And it was almost, and she was on a big white horse. And it was almost as if the sun was hitting her blonde hair, and it was almost like a crown over her head. Uh, and, and I could tell she was very confident. And, and I kind of just let that image coalesce, and it ended up uh, that I knew someone was looking at her, uh, looking at her with both love and fear. Uh, and it would turn out to be her husband in the novel. And, and I suspect that you know, I've been, uh, I've always been fascinated with the building of the Smoky Mountains Park because, it, I mean, it was built during the Depression, and it's just an amazing that, that it happened. And uh, when I wrote Serena, we were at a time in our political, and we still are, unfortunately, where there was a real effort to open up the, our uh, national parks to uh, timbering and mineral rights. Uh, that's still a threat. And so I wanted to write the book as a reminder of of how precious, uh, not just the Smokies, but, but all of our national parks and, uh, and how hard won they were. Can I ask you, did you used to have a Southern rights? I, 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 I am from the South, uh, and I'm very proud of that. I'm pr and proud of the Southern tradition, but I, 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 I'm becoming more and more wary of that kind of label. I mean, I, I feel like I'm, uh, no more a regional writer than Richard Price or Jay McInerney. Uh, but they, they're never called New York writers. You know, we don't say, well, you know, they're just Manhattan writers. And, and I think sometimes the label can be seen, you know, it's almost like you, you imagine a just in front of it. But, but at the same time, it is my landscape. And, and obviously, I think the writers, many of the writers who have mattered the most to me, uh, Welty, Faulkner, O'Connor, uh, uh, those, those writers are from the South, so I, I'm always kind of torn. I suspect Wiley feels some of this too. I mean, you, you don't, you know, you don't want to be labeled, but at the same time, uh, it, it is, uh, you know, I, I'm very proud of, uh, of what the South has done in its literature and its music and its food. You know, we've gotten a lot of things wrong in our history, but the food and the music and the literature, we've done damn well. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, we have time for one more, maybe? One more? Yes, ma'am. Well, 
Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. You're, you read it in ninth grade? I'll, I'll have you all know, you know, uh, last September, you know, in the September, they have banned book week. And, um, you know, they do that in the beginning of the school year and all that. And, and then the bookstores have their meat displays and all that. And so there was a school district in Dallas, um, in Highland Park, a, a part of Dallas. And they decided they would, they would ban Sherman Alexie's book, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. And then someone's like, well, everybody bans that book. There's no big deal. I mean, Sherman's a buddy of mine. I mean, every, he, he like almost wrote the book so it would be banned. So they decided to be really controversial, and they banned The Art of Racing in the Rain. Yeah. So it's, it's, it, there's a whole thing going on right now. It's, it's, it's almost amusing. But the fact that it's, it's, this stuff still goes on, that, you know, that we still have these sort of discussions about literature on this level, you know, it's crazy. Um, but but we do so. I'm I'm glad that uh, it has an appeal to uh, to younger audiences um, as well as uh, adult audiences. Oh God, I, we can't. I cannot figure it out. This is you know my wife is my first reader too, so she's kind of strong willed about these sorts of things. And we were like, well, what on earth would they? Well, I said because there's the there's brief frontal nudity uh, it, it, on a 15 year old girl who's trying to seduce this guy, and uh, and my wife thought about it. And she's like, nah, that's just not enough. I think it's because it's being described by a dog, thereby suggesting bestiality. <laughs> and then she thought about it a little more and she said, nah, I still don't think that's it. I think it's because there's a, in one of the other chapters about the monkey thumbs, there's a line that says, mentions a, a president of questionable moral and, and intellectual fortitude, which is clearly a swipe at George W. Bush and it just took them six years to figure it out. <laughs> so we really don't know why, except that there's some really weird stuff going on in Dallas, and, and I'm trying to get down there and, and maybe, if not stir the pot, at least add a perspective that, you know, from a writer's point of view, why certain things have to be certain ways in a plot to make it work. So, anyway. Well, you know, the, banning books is bad. It's bad, okay? But... Banning books also is a reminder of how important literature is and, and how much it affects people, how much it touches people in both positive and negative ways. And uh, it's also great publicity. So uh, what a wonderful panel. Let's thank them all. I believe that pa our panelists will be signing books outside somewhere. Books can be bought downstairs, right? Okay. Thank you.